Since 2016 till date, there have been numerous attempts by the government to stifle civil liberties in the country through the introduction of questionable legislation that can potentially be abused and used as a tool to systematically kill government critics. It started with the very first attempt to regulate social media content with a bill tagged the Frivolous Petitions Prohibition Bill. The bill was met with massive opposition from the public and civil society, pressuring lawmakers to toss it aside. On June 2, 2016, another controversial bill was introduced in the House of Representatives, but this time it targeted NGOs and civil society organizations. If this bill was allowed to become law, it would have granted government executives overbearing control over the activities of NGOs and civil society organizations with little or no judicial oversight. The bill was later dropped by lawmakers amid heavy public criticism and widespread protest. But in 2019, two more contentious bills, the hate speech and the fake news bill, were introduced with even more questionable clauses that would have damaging consequences to civic engagements. These bills seem to have been designed to gag freedom of expression due to certain provisions which did not meet international human rights standards, as it could easily be abused to punish critics of government policies and actions with punitive measures like fines, life imprisonment or, as provided in the hate switch bill, the death penalty. Over the years, these bills and similar ones like them have been met with decisive resistance from civil society organizations and social activists, thereby compelling lawmakers to abandon any further legislative process to pass them into law. Apparently, government's ambition to exert some sort of control over the civic space remains resolute as demonstrated in the newly amended Company Allied Matters Act, CAMA. On the surface, the act appears to be a piece of legislation with provisions to boost the ease of doing business in Nigeria, but a closer and much detailed study of several clauses within the act begins to reveal a troubling pattern that could very well have negative impacts on civic engagements. One of the anxieties expressed by many is the unchecked powers the law bestows on the Minister of Trade and Investment and the Registrar General of the Corporate Affairs Commission without making any provision for curtailing the excesses of the executives. Under Section 3, Subsection 2, the Minister, with the approval of the President at any time, can remove any member of the Commission from office, where he is of the opinion that the removal of that member is in the interest of the Commission. Section 839 subsection 1 is one of the most contentious aspects of the law where it gives the commission the authority to abruptly suspend the trustee of any association and appoint an interim manager to manage the affairs of that association as long as the commission reasonably believes it is necessary for the purpose of public interest. Under the same section, there is no duration from the interim manager unilaterally appointed by commission to perform its duties even though the NGO is expected to pay the interim manager who may not have any connection with the NGO. This will ultimately be catastrophic to NGO activities and unfortunately, the law conveniently does not provide for much legal recourse to guide against possible abuse of power. If you study critical clauses on the Part F of the Act, you will notice numerous ambiguities which gives room for arbitrary interpretation by the implementing officer. One of the clauses on the Part F allows the Commission to carry out its functions as long as it reasonably believes that it is necessary for the purpose of public interest. This ultimately means that implementing certain components of the law is not necessarily based on facts and evidence but rather on the prerogative of the Commission. Although the Act makes provision for a Board of Inquiry to hear petitions, however, that Board of Inquiry can only be constituted by the Corporate Affairs Commission. This conforms to the argument that the right to a fair hearing becomes lost under this Act. Another area of the law that gives one a cause for concern is Section 831, which states that CAC can make a directive for similar organizations to be treated as the same or NGOs having similar trustees to be treated as the same. The problem here is that it does not state the process it to take to carry out what is actually an involuntary merger of different NGOs just because they are similar in their activities. There is no explanation on how much consideration will be given to the interest, choices and decision of the NGO in making this directive. The Commission does has the unilateral power to decide on the criteria and requirements on how an NGO is registered which may not be according to any laid down guidelines. The camera appears to be a mashup of borrowed provisions from other countries. 
Unfortunately, safeguards such as warnings and power of inquiry which protect against abuse of power are willfully omitted from the Kama. For the sake of protecting the sanctity of democracy and the fundamental human rights of Nigerian citizens from possible abuse, it is imperative that the Kama undergoes a comprehensive review. Firstly, there need to be nationwide consultations from the civil society who would be resourceful in helping the Commission to achieve its aim without having any negative impact on civil liberties. Secondly, the powers given to the Commission and the Minister need to be checked with the necessary safeguards to mitigate any potential abuse of power. This can be done by reviewing and amending the law to clear it of any ambiguities that allow for arbitrary interpretations by implementing officers. Until the issues highlighted in this video are addressed, the Kama will always be a potential danger to civil liberties as government critics will always be at risk of persecutions and clampdowns, bringing to question the validity of our democracy.